Father, we come to you this morning. We thank you for this day. We thank you for these folks that are out here today. We pray now for the folks that aren't with us today that we are traveling, that you give them a blessing today and safety and wherever they're at. Pray now that you just be with our service. For Jesus' sake, amen. And go around and greet each other.
I will. I, I still hear cackling going on. Well, as you can see, we're doing a little bit of old school with no screen or stuff. Our other folks that do that stuff are all gone too today. So, so we'll do it. We'll get it through it this way. And for announcements, um, got Sunday schools in the morning or in Sunday mornings. Paul's doing Revelations next week again. We'll be starting. Uh, our afternoon service, Paul does that. Today will be Carl. Uh, Wednesday evening prayer Bible study we have. We also, uh, uh, who's you leading that this week, Carl? Carl's got leading that this week. We, the, October the 3rd and 4th, 9.30 to 2, we are having a church work day here. I believe there's some, uh, some brush cleanup we're talking about doing. We're talking about doing some tree cutting too I believe yeah I think it sees right here close to the church uh, the 5th of October 10 a.m. to noon ladies Bible study in Ephesians at the church here the Angie's teaching that the 12th of October we're looking at an annual color tour we'll see how the color is at that time I don't know if it'll be good or bad yet but we'll see the 13th of October, we are having a quarterly business meeting. So, is there any other announcements or is there any prayer requests that somebody wants to, to have? Sandy's having surgery Thursday, Sandy? Okay. Remember, Sandy, pray for her. Is there any others? Okay, meals for Sandy. Paper uh, sign-up sheet out in the in the in the uh, lobby there. All right, nothing else. Hymn number two hundred ninety-three, "Amazing Grace." This is not on. It's over in the back of the mixer over there.
<laughs> in the very back, Larry, it's in the back top right hand corner, there should be a switch. Jason, can you find it for him? <laughs> You'll know it when it comes on. Yeah, yeah that's better. Okay. Well, actually, Bob found the reason for the echo. This speaker in particular was turned this way just a little too much. So it was actually, for some reason, helping to pick up the microphone. It wasn't working right. We switched them both back just a little to be on the safe side. Turn, if you will, to Luke chapter 19 for a moment. Another passage related to the one we're going to look at in the Gospel of John today. In Luke chapter 19, beginning in verse 28. Jesus has been talking, and verse 28 says, When he had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. And it came to pass, when he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany, at the mountain called Olivet, that he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village opposite you, where, as you enter, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Loose it, and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, Why are you loosing it? Thus you shall say to him, because the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went their way and found it just as he had said to them. But as they were loosing the colt, the owners of it said to them, Why are you loosing the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of him. Then they brought him to Jesus, and they threw their own clothes on the colt, and they sat Jesus on him. And as he went, many spread their clothes on the road. And then as he was now drawing near the, the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. We're going to look at John's perspective, which has a couple different things in it as well as what Luke has said uh, when we reach that portion of the scripture. So, Carl? All right, let's have one more song. Hymn number 516, I Love to Tell a Story.
Thank you. Carol? While you are turning to John chapter 12, continuing on in chapter 12 from where we left off last week, we realize that the clock is winding down. Throughout previous roughly three years, Jesus has been teaching and ministering to people. He's become immensely popular among some and absolutely detested, particularly by certain of the Jewish leaders. We're now reaching the last few days before the crucifixion. And Jesus is going to be entering Jerusalem and the two major points that I want to look at today are as he enters Jerusalem and then how Jesus is actually going to be glorified, which will begin in verse 20 at that point. And we're going to see that as he is, as he enters Jerusalem, how people praise him. And yet just a few days later, there are going to be the Jewish leaders and a good many people who are going to shout that Jesus should be crucified. And I'm going to suggest, I, I've heard it said, wow, the same people who praised him as king are the ones who wanted him crucified. I don't necessarily think that's the case. There may have been some of those people. But there were others who were looking at Jesus as, if not a savior in the spiritual sense, certainly as a king who might re get them out of the whole Roman Empire type of thing. Some of them undoubtedly for that. But there were others, and we've seen this consistently throughout the gospel, who refuse to believe. And that's really important. Belief is something in this, in this gospel that is incredibly important. So before we look into the passage itself, let's pray, shall we? Father, as we come before you, we just ask for your blessing that the Holy Spirit might truly be our teacher today. May the Lord Jesus Christ be honored and glorified. For we'd ask it in his name. Amen. By the way, you will notice that Carl, when he said he wasn't going to be wordy, he wasn't kidding. That clock says it's 20 after. I don't usually plan on 40 minutes, so you will probably find that we get done just a tad on the early side, which is okay by me. Uh, you know, that we don't need to have a, a set time frame every time exactly how things are going to go. But in John chapter 12, We've seen that Jesus was at a meal. It was honoring him and possibly also to some degree Lazarus because it hadn't been that long before that Jesus raised Lazarus who had died. And Judas, of course, being the wonderful guy that he is, when, this late, when Mary you know, anoints Jesus' feet with oil, lets down her hair and starts wiping his feet, complains that this should have been sold because, you know, it's like a year's worth of wages uh, and all this money given to the poor. We also know that Judas didn't care about the poor. What he cared about was his own pocket because he was a thief and he was in charge of the money and would steal money out of it. Now, my personal belief is Jesus knew exactly what was going on. He knew who Judas was right from the start and what was going to happen, yet he chose him because this is part of fulfillment of all of the prophecies that God had made as to how things were going to work out. And the Jewish leaders, of course, they don't like what's happened with Lazarus. So right in the, at the tail end of the last week, as we looked at in verses 9 uh, through 11, we find out that there were Jewish leaders who wanted not only to kill Jesus, but to kill Lazarus. Can you imagine the kind of hatred that Jesus raises a man who has died, resuscitates him, and yes, at some point he's going to have to die again. We know that. I have to stop and think about it. The only person who has ever been raised from the dead to eternal life is Jesus himself. Now, it will come yet for the rest of us, but that's down the road. Anything else is basically a resuscitation. And Lazarus was resuscitated. He was brought back to life. But he's going to eventually die again. And the Jewish leaders 
don't like the fact that Jesus has done all of this. When you stop and think about all of the differing witnesses to Jesus in Scripture as to who he is, you know, not only John the Baptist, but the works that Jesus did, the Father himself, Jesus' own witness about himself, other disciples' witness, and in particular, John himself, who says at the end that he knows all of these things are true. They want to kill Lazarus because Jesus raised him and because people are flocking to him. Verse 11 says, Because on account of him, many of the Jews went away and believed in Jesus. Well, it tells us that the next day after this, this meal, it says, A great multitude that had come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, and cried out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Wow. Now, some theologians say, you know, we, we usually refer to this as Palm Sunday, and there are some theologians who think that maybe this actually happened on Monday uh, as opposed to Sunday, and, and there are reasons why they think that, uh, but I don't really see any reason to believe that what this is is Sunday. And... They hear that Jesus is coming to Jerusalem. How they heard, we don't know. Somebody told them. And people start gathering together and they come out and they bring all these palm branches with them. And we're told, you know, that Jesus, and, and we'll see it again later here, but we're told in Luke that Jesus had set it up so that he would be riding a donkey's colt that had never been ridden before. Now that could be interesting. You ever seen somebody, for instance, climb on the back of a horse that's never been ridden before? What tends to happen? They either hold on really, really tight or somebody goes flying. You know, and that can be really interesting. And yet Jesus sat on this colt. Now we don't know exactly how old the colt was. You know, I mean, you know, a, a horse might live, for instance, to be 20, 25 years old. So a two or three year old is still pretty young. And yet, look at what they do for the Kentucky Derby. Young horses. So we don't know exactly how big this particular colt was, but nobody had ever ridden it before. And Jesus is going to do that. Well, as he is coming toward Jerusalem, people are coming out in great numbers to meet him. Now, what those great numbers are, we don't know. But there's quite a few people. We don't know for sure exactly why they used palm branches, but there are a couple of good reasons why. May well have been to honor him as, as a potential, you know, as their potential Messiah. Certainly within reason. Maybe to some degree, given the fact that they are saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel, maybe this is part of the way of expressing, we want deliverance from Rome. I'm sure there were people who wanted that. There were others, I'm sure, who would have been looking at him as a great miracle provider, somebody who could heal the sick, somebody who literally could control the weather. Wouldn't that be nice? How many of you would like to see some rain today? <laughs> Given how, many, how much we haven't had recently. You know, things are really dry out there. Jesus could control the weather. He healed diseases. He cast out demons. On several occasions, he resuscitated people who had died. And I'm sure there were a good many people who... Beyond that, really didn't think a great deal about who Jesus really is. And yet there are others who, in fact, were committed to him as the Messiah. And while they didn't fully understand everything about Jesus and who he really is, they were still committed to him. Eleven out of those twelve disciples certainly were. Now, were they perfect? Absolutely not. But there are people who are, in fact, committed. So they come out. They say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. 
Verse 14 says, Jesus, when he had found a young donkey, sat on it. As it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. And if you were to go to Zechariah chapter 9, you would read more about that. Uh, I'm not going to turn there. Uh, you can do that for yourselves, but Zechariah chapter 9 in particular. And as Jesus is sitting on this colt, he is fulfilling prophecy. I find it interesting, just as a sideline, how many people who don't believe in Jesus as the eternal Son of God become man want to say, well, he just manipulated all this stuff. How many things did Jesus fulfill that he could not possibly have manipulated? If he was simply a human being, he had no choice over being born, and particularly born of a virgin. He had no choice about being born in Bethlehem. And it wasn't like, you know, somehow Jesus himself, uh, before he was born, said to Mary, go to Bethlehem, so you can have me born there. It didn't work that way. You know, there's so many of the prophecies that Jesus could not have manipulated. This one, obviously, he knew. And he knew the prophecy, and he was... He made arrangements for it, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. And I got a sneaky suspicion from what I read here, that, uh, and, and we'll see in a minute, that there are actually two groups of people here. The first group are those who are just coming out to meet him, but there's another group, and they were people who had been present when Lazarus was raised from the dead. And they also are part of this whole thing. But Jesus is fulfilling prophecy. And I find the disciples' whole attitude in this kind of interesting. Verse 16. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written about him and that they had done these things to him. You think maybe they're just a little bit on the dense side? Do you really think we'd have been any different if we were in their shoes? I don't think so. There's such a spiritual blindness in the world. We were talking a little bit about some of the things that are going on in, in, when we were in Sunday school this morning. Uh, some of the things that are going on in what's called evangelicalism. You will hear somebody say something about, well, evangelicals this or evangelicals that. You need to pay real close attention because the word evangelical today has virtually lost its meaning. It can mean anything from a church like ours that believes that this is God's word, inerrant, infallible, inspired. To people and I'll use the name, like Andy Stanley, who, Charles Stanley's son, for those of you who know who Charles Stanley is, Andy Stanley, who when people say things like, well, the Bible says, will say, the Bible doesn't say that. Matthew said it, or John said it, or Paul said it, but the Bible doesn't say that. We won't go any farther because I get really upset over stuff like that. And we really don't have to follow, you know, things like we don't have to really follow the Bible. We just have to follow who Jesus is and believe in his resurrection. Where do you think you find out about all of that? It's granted that, that people have been commissioned by God to preach the gospel. That's fine. But how do you know that they haven't altered it or changed it? Because God gave us something in writing. So, but the disciples don't understand. and Eventually, they will. As Jesus is raised from the dead and as they meet him and experience him in his, in his glorified body, they begin to see it. And then in verse 17, 
The people who were with him when he called Lazarus out of his tomb and raised him from the dead bore witness. Here's that other group of people. Not only do you have other people from the town who are coming out, but you have this particular group of people who have seen Lazarus rise out of that tomb. They're bearing witness as to what Jesus has done. They said, for this reason, the people also met him because they heard that he had done this sign. That raises the question again, how many of these people truly were accepting Jesus as the promised Messiah? And how many were just looking for signs and wonders and great things to happen? And I will tell you that there are people in this world today that think that just because you preach the gospel, you have to have signs and wonders and all sorts of fancy things happening. It's like one guy who is supposed to, and, and there are videos of him supposedly, this guy with a slightly shortened leg by like maybe an inch or so, and he's supposed to be lengthening the leg. And if you look really carefully, you can see the manipulation that he does. It's all fake. But people are looking for great signs and wonders today. You hear guys say that, oh, I've raised people from the dead. Prove it. Prove it. I want to see hard, fast proof. Somebody tells me that they've raised somebody from the dead. Well, verse 19, the Pharisees therefore said among themselves, you see that you are accomplishing nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Uh, I don't have the exact words, but the NIV has something along the lines of, we're not getting anywhere with this. The whole world has gone after it. Well, that's obviously hyperbole. The whole world hasn't. But this is how much they hate Jesus. They're frustrated. They want to, in their own way, they think they're obeying God. But they're not. They've missed the point. It's happening today and I don't see things changing a great deal you know there there is by the way uh, and, and it's been mentioned before but there is a theology out there that the church is somehow going to bring in the kingdom into this world and that everything is going to be made right when the church brings the kingdom into the world my Bible says the last days things are going to get worse and worse I do not see the church doing that kind of work that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be about doing God's work. But we should never expect to bring in the kingdom. God will do it in his own way in his own time. So Jesus is entering Jerusalem. There are people there who are extolling him as king. There are other people who are getting ready to murder him. Verse 20 tells us now, and here we're going to look at, at Jesus' glorification in the law, at, or how it's beginning. There were certain Greeks among those who came up to worship at the feast. Then they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and asked him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew, and in turn, Andrew and Philip told Jesus. The interesting thing is we're never told whether they ever met Jesus or not. I've seen commentators who think both ways, that maybe he did meet them, and others who think absolutely not. I don't know. But here are some people who are non-Jewish people who apparently are God followers. Somehow they've heard, and somehow they want to see Jesus, and maybe they got to, maybe they didn't. Personally, I don't think they did, but I can't prove that. It is interesting. Jesus answered them, that's Philip and Andrew, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Wow. Glorified. What does that mean? All of a sudden he's going to turn radiant? And like, you know, with the transfiguration? It's not what's going to happen. He's going to explain that here beginning in verse 24. 
He says, the hour, or he says, most assuredly I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. Jesus really is saying, in a roundabout way, if I die, more fruit is going to be produced. That's going to come about later. And it's really important to keep in mind because remember that there have been at least three times in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, at least three times, where we know that Jesus said it is necessary for the Son of Man to be taken, arrested, killed, buried, and rise again. Necessary. And Jesus' glorification is actually going to happen in particular in just a few days on a wooden cross. Jesus also goes on to talk about those who follow him. He says, he who loves his life will lose it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me, and where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my Father will honor. Remember that at one point, as Jesus is talking to his disciples, he talked to them about taking up your cross, he said. And I've mentioned this before, and I, and I think it's worth repeating. <clears throat> Taking up your cross in this day and age. If you literally took up your cross, you were on your way to die. And I believe that Jesus is saying here that if you really want to follow him, you don't literally hate this life in this world. It's not Jesus' point. What's most important? Following Him. It's so easy to get sidetracked. You know, oh, the hot water heater went. i got to get that fixed or rolls. Well, it's important. Especially if it's the middle of the winter, you might want hot water for things. You know, or the furnace goes out in the middle of the winter and you want to get it fixed. But what ultimately is most important. It's going to come into play in a, in a bit. But Jesus said, if you serve me, follow me. Where I am, that's where my servants are going to be. And if you serve me, my Father will honor you. That's neat. But Jesus moves on here. In verse 27, he says, now my soul is troubled. Wow. You think maybe he's a few days away from his death on the cross. He knows it's coming. It's been planned. He's moved toward it. You think maybe there's some trouble there in heart? This is where the Incarnation is such a mystery. How can the eternal Son of God, who cannot die, become a man who can die? And how, knowing that he's going to go through all this but be raised again, why would he be bothered? But again, he's a human being as well. Truly human. It's not surprising that he's troubled. Anybody here like the idea of pain? I keep telling people I have spent my entire life avoiding pain for one reason. It hurts. Don't like it. So Jesus says his soul is troubled. He says, what shall I say? Now this is an interesting thing because most of the translations that I looked at have it exactly like the New King James does here. 
He says, what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. One commentator in particular thinks that what Jesus is doing is saying, what shall I say? That's the question. And then the Father, save me from this hour, is a prayer with a response saying, but for this purpose, I came to this hour. You can take your pick. Personally, I think it reads better as, as, yep, he's troubled, and he's telling his disciples, what am I going to say? Should I say, Father, save me from this hour? This is the reason I came. Wow. So I think the way it reads in most of our translations is actually the better reading. But I find it interesting. Father, glorify your name. How about on a practical level? Have we ever had problems? Things upset us? What's our response? How many times have we been in a situation where things are really troubling us and we don't say, Father, glorify your name in this? I think that's really important. I don't know about you, but I don't do it often enough. Father, glorify your name. Whatever the problem is, Jesus is facing the worst thing that can ever happen. He's going to take on the sin of the world. Paul put it this way. He said, he who knew no sin became sin for us. That's how bad it is. And our troubles in comparison... Don't even, they don't even mount to a grain of sand on the tallest mountain in the world. But do we say when those troubles hit, Father, glorify your name. Jesus could do that, and he was facing the worst that could happen. Then we're told a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. How is he going to do that? The Father is putting Jesus, his own son, on a cross for us. Verse 29 says, The people who stood by and heard it said, It had thundered. Others said an angel has spoken to him. So they heard a noise. They weren't sure exactly what's happening. Some thought it was thunder. Some, some thought an angel spoke. But Jesus says in verse 30, This voice did not come because of me, but for your sake. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. This he said, signifying by what death he would die. The world is going to be judged. And I would suggest to you that when Jesus on the cross will say, it is finished. Everything that needed to be done to ensure the salvation of those who believe, everything that needed to be done to ensure that God's plan for the world was completed, everything that needed to be done to ensure the defeat of Satan was finished. That doesn't mean Satan's not active. Those of us who have studied military history realize if you take a really close look at American history, when the Americans succeeded at D-Day, the war in Europe essentially was already won. The Battle of the Bulge, while it caused problems, was never going to be what Hitler wanted it to be. Even had he been able to take the oil fields that he wanted, and I don't think he would have, because I think the Americans and other allies would have destroyed them, or at least made the attempt. But the war essentially was over. When Jesus died on that cross, the war was over. Satan doesn't think so. And he's going to keep trying, and he's going to win a few battles here and there. And I think he's doing that among the evangelical church today because he's destroying certain segments of it. Thank goodness. 
that God has given us churches and people who stand for the truth today. But the war is essentially won. And there's going to come a spot, and Paul is going to get there when he gets into Revelation, when Satan's going to be cast away for a thousand years. At the end of that thousand years, he's going to be let loose. And can you imagine as much as Satan hates God? The rage and the anger that must, he must experience, and then all of a sudden he's let free, and he's going to try his best to defeat the Lord again. And it's not going to work. How neat that is. Jesus says, if I'm lifted up from the earth, I will draw all peoples to myself. Some Calvinists like to say that this says, I will draw all kinds of people to myself. They like to do that because back in John chapter 6, we're told that Jesus said very clearly that nobody comes to him unless the Father draws him. And Jesus is talking about drawing people to himself here. Same word. I would suggest to you that there are two different aspects. That in John chapter 6, Jesus is more talking about the individual as, as individuals being drawn to him for salvation. And here, Jesus is basically saying, you put me on that cross, and every human being in the world is now totally responsible for what they do with me. Every human being. A little bit of a difference there. Now, people can argue with that. Some theologians are going to argue with that. They're welcome to be wrong. That's okay. Uh, you know, but in any event, I, it's, my belief here is that Jesus is saying everybody is responsible because this has been planned from all eternity. God knew what he was doing. And he set this plan in motion that Jesus would die on the cross. All of this was done before the world was ever created. And everybody is responsible for what they do with Jesus Christ. To believe in him or not, take your pick. If you believe in him, you have eternal life. If you don't commit yourself to him, you're doomed. Verse 33 says that he said this signifying by what death he would die. And the people, and we're not going to look at it right now, we'll look at it, Lord willing, next week. The people understood. When Jesus said, Lift, if I be lifted up, they, they knew he meant being crucified. And they've, they're going to have some response as a result of that. I would suggest to you that as we move down the road, and as we look toward the crucifixion itself, that is where we see the glory of God shine the brightest. It wasn't a pleasant event. Jesus didn't like having to go through it, but he did, and he did so willingly. His friends deserted him. His mother and others, a few others stood at the base of the cross having to watch all of this, and it had to hurt. And yet, God's glory shines the brightest on that cross. Because God has fulfilled all of his promises to date. And that means he'll fulfill all the ones that he's given us for the future as well. As those people who were bringing Jesus into Jerusalem and saying, or calling Jesus the King of Israel, most of them probably had no real clue what that meant. By God's grace and through His Word, we know what it means. He truly is the King of Israel. And He is not only the King of Israel, He is the King of Kings, Lord of Lords. He rules over His whole creation. He created it. He sustains it. He rules over. 
What a cause for rejoicing. But backing up just a little bit, the question is, when troubles hit, and they will hit, do we say, Father, glorify your name, even in this. Jesus could do it, facing the worst thing that was ever going to happen. Do we? We should, by God's grace. Let's pray. Father, we just ask that you would take your word, bless it, and Lord, just uh, thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ and for what he was willing to go through for us. He certainly didn't have to, but he chose to do it. We thank you for that. Now we just ask for your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Hello? Thank you, Carl. All right, for our hymn, final hymn this morning, hymn number 440, follow on. Would we stand, please? Thank you. You are dismissed. <laughs>